Um, so today we're going to get, talk about getting started in your business and really leveraging the internet, which is a great tool, particularly for people who don't have a lot of resources, um, because you can reach a whole lot of people. So we're going to talk about that a bit, and Tamika's going to start. Okay. So, you know, one of the things that uh, I'm sure you know, but is helpful to remember, is that there's writing and there's journalism. One kind is more reporter, reporting based, and one kind you can just come off the top of your head and essay write or something, some other kind of content that you want to write that may not require you to interview someone. So, um, but either kind of writing, whether it's journalistic writing, freestyling writing, or other kinds of writing can get you uh, a following, can have people pay attention to your work, can have uh, people reach out to you because they see you writing about something that they're interested in. Um, and uh, help you get, even land a job someplace if you uh, put it in the right places. So one of the things that we want to talk about is how you can use um, different kinds of writing um, and distribute it through social media or have it, position yourself to have it distributed through social media. Um, and so, so that's, that's, that's one, one thing I wanted to just kind of point out really quickly. Yeah. So Tamika and I both have the experience of having started very small and working our way up. My very first writing sample was like this big. It was like 80 words long, right? And so what you want to do over time is you want to assemble like a photographer assembles a portfolio of photographs or an art, art, artist assembles a portfolio of whatever medium they work in. As a writer, you want to assemble a portfolio of clips, right? And so the fact of the matter is, in the beginning of most people's career, they get assigned small pieces because the editor doesn't know if they can trust them, right? So the editor is not going to take a lot of risk in the beginning. So you get assigned small pieces or cheap pieces where the rate that you get paid is very low, or maybe it's free. That's okay. You just want to start, right? So. Um, what we would encourage you to do is start small. I started with this little clip. Tamika started um, with an internship, Three right? lines. I wrote three lines at the bottom of a magazine. If you flip too fast, you missed it. <laughs> yeah. So we started very small. And then what you do is you start to work it. So once you've proven that you can write something 80 words long, it's just a little blurb, then they can trust you to write another blurb. And before long, you'll have a little collection of just little short blurb kind of things. But once they know they can trust you with something, whatever, 100 words long or 150 words long, then they start to know that they can trust you with something 250 or 300 words long. Or you could take your little 80 word blurb to another publication and say, hey, this is my writing. You know, I did this for this organization. I would like to, to pitch an idea to you, or would you be willing to assign me something about this length or a little longer? You don't, if you, have a, if you um, are new to writing or you don't have a relationship with the magazine, it's pretty difficult to go in pitching a thousand word piece or um, something very long or that's going to take a lot of pages. You have to build the rapport and the trust. So don't be afraid to start small and work up. You can start with small publications. So my neighborhood in Philadelphia, we have a newspaper and then the next neighborhood over has a newspaper and the next neighborhood over has a newspaper and they're all published by the same company. So in my neighborhood, many people will, who want to be writers will start with these neighborhood newspapers. And then there are larger newspapers that are alternative newspapers. They're not the, they're not the main newspaper for the city, but they're um, alternative newspapers. Maybe they um, um, target younger people or people who are a little bit more liberal politically or that kind of thing. So they might go from the um, community newspaper to the alternative newspaper and from the alternative newspaper to the big, big newspaper in town. Or they might go from the community newspaper and start to pitch some small magazines. So I actually worked at a small magazine for years. Um, actually, my first job as an editor in journalism was at a small magazine. And um, a, lot of the a lot of the writers who I used to hire are actually big name writers now. So they started small and they just worked their way up. So um, mine was an African American magazine. And so in the American pecking order, if you're doing a black magazine, it's less prestigious than a mainstream magazine 
that who, most of whose readers really because of the demographics of the United States will be white. But um, so I started at this small black magazine, but then I was able to leverage it and to eventually write for bigger magazines, both within the African American community. So we talked earlier about Essence Magazine, Ebony Magazine, and Black Enterprise. Remember we had those written up there, unfortunately maybe in a permanent marker. Um, um, so those are the major African-American magazines. So I've written in those magazines, but also in some mainstream magazines whose primary demographic is um, white people. Um, and I started at the Amsterdam News, which is a small newspaper, but it's also the oh. oldest newspaper in the United States. The great thing about working for the Amsterdam News is that they don't, well, they don't pay you a lot, but they give you big stories right off the bat. Yes. So like they'll, 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 they'll trust you without having a whole lot of experience. So like my first assignment was to go, what they call into the field and cover a press conference. I had only written a blurb. I ended up walking away with a 500 word story and they didn't even give me a limit on the number of words. I don't know if you guys kind of can contextualize. 100 words is like a small paragraph. 500 words is a pretty good size, like maybe half the, the size of a, a newspaper um, page. And like a thousand words may be both sides of the newspaper. Um, or a magazine page. For, for a tabloid for, that for, opens like this yes. way. Not the long, this way. Yeah. If you're interested in being published, write this down. Yeah. Amsterdam News is actually a place that you guys may be able to write for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they're looking for content that, and they're, they're always looking for content. You want to go with places that need daily content. Yes. So they're a little bit less discerning than a magazine. They may have like a lineup of writers that they use every single month and may not have as much... Uh, um, of a need for as much content, but a daily newspaper, especially one that is printed as well as online, they need a lot of content. Yeah. So that's another place you want to focus on, is places that need constant content, yeah. because they're much more likely to take a chance on someone who's newer than uh, a magazine that only publishes once a month. Yeah, yeah. And so the umbrella organization in the United States for all the African American newspapers is called the National Newspaper Publishing Association, NNPA. And I think their website might be nnpa.org. So you can start with a small magazine. So the magazine that I started with was a small magazine. It was about 24 pages long, as opposed to a major magazine might be 100 or 150 pages long, 85 pages long, something like that. So I started there and I assembled a number of, number of clips and then I was able to start to have conversations with other people or other people would start to see my work and call me because they understood that I did health journalism and there are not that many people who do health journalism. Um, also smaller websites. So especially websites need content and they're trying to keep it fresh. They're trying to have new content very frequently. Some of them every day, some of them several times a week for, for smaller websites. So don't be afraid to take a chance or to reach out to some smaller websites. You can start here locally or you can, I mean, the web is international so you might not even need to restrict yourself to, um, to pitching people locally. So these are some ways where, that you can begin to get started. You want to add Smaller something? as well as new websites. New. Um, websites that are looking for writers. Um, those are the places you want to, I don't know, what, what's the equivalent here? So in the United States, they have what are called classified ads. You can find on a website called Craigslist, for instance. And in, in the Washington, D.C. area, they do a lot of uh, looking for writers. And they may offer you something small, like 30 cents a word. Um, that's, some, that's on in the United States a, a really small rate. Um, and some will be looking for free writers or free content. But the point that Hillary is making is your goal when you're first starting out is to build your number of clips. And do you guys understand what clips are? Yeah. Clips are just these stories that you put together over time so that you can pass along to someone either physically, and these days more it's more um, web-based, to, to show your portfolio, show everything that you've done to give yourself an opportunity to show your, the variety of kind of work that you can do. Um, and as I mentioned, it can be journalistic work or it could be content that you just created for a new website that has nothing to do with journalism, but it just shows your ability to write. So um, small places, new places, those are like prime breeding <laughs> grounds. And, and this anywhere, <laughs> anywhere that has an interest in knowing your story, which I mean, you can, with a good pitch, you can make anywhere interested in knowing your story. So I would not limit, limit yourself 
to local and use the web, you know, as much as possible to see what opportunities exist. Yeah, and the minute you're on the web, you're international. You could potentially be seen by anyone. So also, just because it's small or just because it's new um, or not very popular yet, don't let your standards lag. Do your best work everywhere you go because everybody can see it these days. It follows you forever, and then you can use it to leverage to move up. So we talked about writing blurbs. I have a job um, on Tuesdays. I run a newsletter for a nonprofit organization in the United States. It's an organization, um, which I think I mentioned to you previously, is focused on African Americans, African Americans mostly, but the black conversation around the world about HIV and AIDS. And so um, you, there are newsletters that need content. That particular newsletter, we only run one piece or two pieces of original content each week. And then we get stories from other play, places. We call it, we repurpose stories. We find other places on the web which will let you rerun their stories. And so every week we run five stories, one to two of them we paid for. But these are ways that you can assemble clips and also get a little money, like start to build your business, start your business going. Um, you can start with your current job and start to um, assemble clients and assemble clips and get yourself another um, stream of income going while you still have another job. Um, you can do the same thing. Tamika has a really wonderful business in um, that she taps into from time to time in doing public relations materials and marketing materials. I know there's some PR and marketing people here. I know that some of you who do PR work for an organization, but those skills, you own them. So you can take those very same skills to other organizations and start a little business and start doing promotional things for them. You do this, so do you want to comment on that? Sure. Um, the PR and marketing materials are an example of non-journalistic work. It's an example of uh, just your writing skills. So part of what I do um, is I write bios, what are called biographies, bios for short, for music artists. Um, you know, if Usher has a new album coming out, uh, what they'll do, is, what Sony Music will do is hire me to interview him. I guess it is kind of journalistic in a way, but mostly the intention is to build interest in his new album. So it'll be the story of his life condensed, <laughs> which they, um, right, it's just like they would any other story on a piece of paper, and they distribute it along with um, what's called a media kit, which is clips of other stories that have been done on him, along with his music. And they put it together in a little package, usually it's a little folder, and they mail it to all the journalists that they want to write music reviews for him. So if I'm a journalist with Rolling Stone, I'm going to get a package maybe a month before Usher's album comes out. It's gonna contain all these Rolling Stone stories about him the year or two before. It's gonna contain the music. If, you know, back in the day it was actual CDs, now they'll send the MP3 to you um, and you can just download it. But they'll also um, give you a bio. And they may give it to you in a folder now or they may give it to you digitally. But either way, that is a good way to earn income um, because it's a feature story, feature length. The longer the story usually, the more the money. Um, and they also, on the flip side of that, you can do what are called, um, let's see, blanking on the word, but so marketing materials for large companies, slogans. Yeah. I think one time I wrote five words and got paid a lot of money and it was an idea. It was an idea of how to represent that company going forward in a certain area. So if we're talking about Toyota and you, and you want to say Toyota, moving mountains, those two words, nice. You're not writing a lot, it's just your ideas. So that's an example of non-journalistic writing that can help you build your business. Because if you have a knack for that, if you're already business-minded, if you've gone to school, say for business, you have a sense of you know, branding, which is big these days, that's one of the elements of branding that people with our training can do. That's helpful. That's good. Um, and then so gradually you want to work your way up to larger publications. You'll get longer pieces. You'll get paid a higher rate. So Tamika said, like in the U.S., maybe something new, a new, um, a new publication 
And if you're new, maybe they'll pay. Maybe they'll want you to do it for free. Maybe they'll want you to do stuff for 10 cents a word, 20 cents a word, 30 cents a word. And so that would be what 20? That might be 400 burr, um, right? Yeah, this is yeah. 20 burr, for instance. Right, at 20 burr to a dollar <laughs> per word. Um, but eventually, you might work your way up to, if you write a story for a website, that might be a couple of hundred dollars. So that might be 4,000 burr um, to write a story for a website, or maybe even more. If you write a story for a magazine, um, maybe you'll get paid $1,000 US. So that's 20,000 burr. Um, so you want to work your way up, because these can be high paying um, jobs for you. Um, I also want to say, so at this point, once you're out there, your work starts circulating, right? And it takes on a life of its own. People see it, and then they call you for things, right? So one time I wrote a story. It ran in Essence magazine. Totally unbeknownst to me, somebody was looking for a writer for a book. They were having trouble finding a writer. They needed a health writer. They just were not happy with any of the health writers who they interviewed. I think they had interviewed 30. And the, 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 um, a woman who ran the publishing company, so this is a company that publishes books, she was getting tired, she wanted this book written, and so she told um, uh, the, the author of the book, or the person who had the expertise, look, go to the supermarket, go to the magazine rack, pick up a magazine, turn it to the health section, and call that person. So that person went to the supermarket, they picked up an Essence magazine, they opened it to the health section, which just happened to be a month that I wrote the health story. I get a phone call. Now I'm being offered the opportunity to speak with this person about writing their book. And so a book project that I worked on that ended up hitting, um, this is a really pre prestigious thing. So we've been talking a lot, I know in the other classes, like about the New York Times. So the book sold so many copies, it was number two or three on the New York Times list, and you all are familiar with Amazon.com, right? It was number two on Amazon.com, and it would have been number one, except, do you know Harry Potter? The Harry Potter books? A Harry Potter book came out the same day. So we were number, we just sat at number two on Amazon for weeks and weeks. So yeah, so you wanna play, you wanna get in the game. It doesn't matter if you're starting small. It builds over time. And at the magazine that I worked with, which was this small magazine, um, it was small in the hierarchy and pecking orders of health magazines in the United States. It was the first black health and wellness magazine in the United States. The world of white people didn't really know about it, but black people all over the country got that magazine and they were decision makers and all sorts of, uh, oh, actually, I showed you guys earlier in the week, uh, last week, a book that I wrote on black women's health. That actually came about from a relationship from that magazine. And then I met so many of the people who are now my writer friends, who are in the group that Tamika has founded, who I now see on major websites where they're writing for major magazines and doing really interesting things. So do your rise, best work. Do, your best. do your best work and rise. Yeah. I, have a, I have a similar story, actually. It's funny, it really, just to her point about do your best work mm -hmm. and make sure that whatever it is that you put out best represents you, which means do spell check, make sure that your words are exactly what you want them to have someone look over it. If you're not good at proofing or you know, you're not necessarily uh, strong at grammar, have someone who's strong at grammar look at your work before you have it published or before you send it to an editor. These things matter. Um, I did a, a small story for Vibe Magazine a long time ago and it was, I don't even remember what it was on. It was, it was something that I just did. Uh, someone who was a talent scout uh, for MTV was on an airplane and read that story and thought that the writing was so strong they called me to um, audition to be a host of a TV show. Okay, oh. small story. Didn't think very much about it. Got a little check for it. All of a sudden, I'm being asked to audition for a TV show as a host. So, I mean, this is an example of how something that you want your work to reflect you for it to be something so solid that people are interested in learning more about what you can do. And even looking at you to potentially cross platforms. Just like Hillary said, that was a magazine to a book. Yep. You know, magazine to TV. All of it counts. Yep. And then, actually to build on that idea, so I went from a magazine to a book, 
and then to another book, to another book, to another book, to another book. And books compared to magazine articles are big paydays. Yes. There. So as I think about the mix of things that I do every year, every year I try to do at least one book. Sometimes I'm lucky and I get two books done. If I can get two books done in a year, it's a difficult year, but I made a lot of money. And yeah, all of it so started with a blurb. All started so with don't a blurb. So let don't let this be like, oh my God, I'll never get there. Because you can. Just believe that you can. Start with the blurb. Craft that blurb. blurb. Make that blurb so good, so tight, so right that someone wants you to write a book. You can do it. Yeah. 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 Good. Okay. Um, and so one really amazing thing that you all can take advantage of now is the miniature work of any kind goes on the internet. You're global, it's the World Wide Web. Anybody from anywhere in the world can call you. So Tamika's gonna start by talking about the power of the internet. Okay. So um, different forms of media require different, have different rules. So what you will find with websites is that you're not gonna usually find um, as long a stories on the website as you find in a magazine or a newspaper. Why? Because people are looking on their phones first thing in the morning, whether eating breakfast or drinking coffee, or they're on the you know, bus or something, and they're looking quickly. They're not trying to read a long story. So you know, if you are looking to potentially pitch a story to a new website or you know, a local story, um, you might want to keep the word count that you have in mind that you're, that you're suggesting to somewhere in the 350 range or 400 range. For the, for the publications that I write for online, they generally, and unless it's like a big feature story um, or it involves different components of multimedia, you know, there's a slideshow attached to it or, you know, it's a feature, um, I usually don't write more than about 400 words, 500 words, and that's on the larger, larger end. Some stories are as much as, or little as 250 words. So you want to write brief. You want to write concise. You don't want to describe the drapes and the colors and this the wind, you know, made the smell. No one cares about that. What they want to know is what's happening, what's happening next. You know, talk about, it's more like the who, what, where, when, why um, kind of approach to web writing. And of course that will change dependent upon the, the audience, right? So, you know, if you're doing a music review, for instance, you're going to have some of that more, what we call flowery language, more descriptive language. And even that may be something that's short. Um, but if you're talking about like a hard news article, you know, um, 300 people were stranded today after a mudslide in Bolivia, you want to get to exactly what happened, who it happened to, where it happened to, you know, and whatever other details are really pertinent to the story. So that's one of the things that's important about remembering to write, write for the web, it's brevity, it's briefness. Um, and uh, so I said, get to the point, for readers who can scan rather, yeah, so cl clickbait. So one thing that's huge, huge, huge for writing for the web is sometimes the best work you do for the web is not necessarily the story, it's the headline <laughs> or it's the subtext. Um, how many times can you remember looking on your phone and just being so shocked by the headline that you just had to click on it? Sometimes editors will choose people who are really um, talented at writing those headlines more so than the story because they want to make sure that there's traffic to the website. Now, it does matter the quality of the story. I don't mean to say write a great headline and just go to sleep. Um, because they also do things like um, count how many pages you look through on the website. Um, so sometimes it will be like initial click on a page and you read a story, um, but it won't be complete on that page and then you'll need to go to the next page. And they want to, they, so the websites love to see that you are continuing to look on their site. So um, clickbait is what we call headlines that make you want to click. Um, the subhead, so it, let's say something like, um, let me give you an example. Hillary, I'm trying to think of something just totally like crazy. Uh -huh. Well, if it were a story about me, um, a subhead could be Hillary 
walks away from her job. Hillary walks, Hillary turns her back on her job. Hillary walks out on her job. Hillary, like something Hillary more out. spicy. Hillary's yeah, Hillary, out. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Don't you want to know why Hillary's out? If you care about Hillary, you might have an interest in knowing, right? right. So if we're talking about Hillary Clinton, for instance, that's, that's something you, in the United States, you might want to click on that because she's a presidential candidate. So that's just an example of how you will entice the reader to, to click on your story and then um, hopefully read it throughout. Get to the point we discuss brevity, who, what, where, when, why, how. Use common language. This is not the time to roll out the really long sort of uh, uh, um, complicated words. You want to write like you're having a conversation with someone. I would write the story just like I'm talking to you right now because it's easily, it's, it's what we call easily accessible. It's pedestrian. It's uh, easy for most people to understand. You don't want to write like it's academic text, like you're writing your dissertation or something. Don't go there. You want to write so that people who of any background can get to the, can understand what you're saying at any given time. Um, let's see, the most important information in the first two graphs, that's what we've been talking about. A captivating lead and a succinct nut graph. It's having the story kind of summed up um, or at least, it could either be summed up or it could be just something that's what we call titillating. It's interesting. It makes you want to read more. And then it'll explain exactly what the whole point of the story in the nut graph. So I don't know if I'm explaining that yeah, the, the, the most succinct way. Yeah. But basically you want every, everything to be known, the most important facts to be known in the first two paragraphs of the story if you're writing for the web. Um, keywords. I'm a little bit less... Um, yeah, because I think about keywords in like the, the title and the subtitles, but there might be consistent words that you use throughout the story that um, will convey a theme. Um, I'm trying to that, think that that are there are words that people are likely to search for, Thank right? You. Yeah. So you want to use words that people are likely to search for, and you can Google keywords um, on different topics, like what are keywords around a subject area. Right. Use those words. It really goes to the point of using conversational language, using terms that people are looking for, not using, not pulling out your big words that you learned in college. Use the language that people speak in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, bullets, numbers, and lists are big. Um, one story uh, sort of format that people, uh, that many websites use in the United States are what, what they call <laughs> listicles. It's like the top nine, man, nine ways to get your man to ask you to marry him. And instead of giving you this whole long story, they'll just give you a bulleted list. You know, step one, you know, make sure that you cook him dinner every night or something. These are just really random things that I'm saying, but like basically the gist of it is that it's the, it's the idea that someone can quickly read through the list as opposed to reading a whole long drawn out story um, and they'll want to continue reading that list all the way to the end. So that's an example of how you can use bullets or numbers. It's the same thing, just boom, 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 yeah. um, to, to write for the media, for can social I, media. Yeah, mm -hmm. can I add to that? Yeah. Okay, so Tamika it mentioned earlier that we're trying to look for ways to engage our audience and make it accessible for them. It's a lot easier for somebody's eye to move through a list than it is through a dense paragraph. Right? So lots of times you'll want to look for ways to break up the text so it can be sh maybe shorter paragraphs and then maybe a couple of bullets and then maybe another paragraph or, or get to numbered lists or tip lists, that kind of thing. Um, these days we're really fighting for people's attention because there's so many different distractions and people are being trained by their phones, by, by YouTube, by all these different social media have a short attention span. So we want to create content that can deliver them value, but they can also move through quickly. And to, to make this point about the clickbait, oh, we forgot to mention hypertext links. Oh, yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. So various ways. So Tamika mentioned that um, the, the website you write for is really going to be interested in whether people click on your story, cl click on your headline or click on your story, and then 
look for something related or maybe you've embedded some links into the story that they can then click on and then that's how they move their way through the site from interesting thing to oh this is interesting thing to oh this is interesting thing and um, they they essentially capture you you're kind of captivated by the site and they can then leverage the numbers the numbers of clicks the numbers of eyeballs they call it the number of eyeballs on the site the number of times people click through and or how long they stay on the site they then sell that um, to advertisers, it increases the value of the um, advertisements that they're able to sell. Because um, remember, in the end of the day, this is all a business. We're on the content side of it, but they have to be able to make money. So. Exactly. Yep. Um, one idea per paragraph. Uh, you're going to naturally do that if you're writing for the web because, again, you're not like trying to give a whole lot of information uh, in a very long sort of format. So it's just remembering to break up the pieces that you're writing into short paragraphs, um, again, with the intention of keeping people interested. You know, I don't know how you guys read your content, but I know if I, I glaze over, I completely just go to sleep or I just I don't even stay on the page if there's too much being introduced in one section. So it might be 100, 150 words in one paragraph and the sim similar length for the next paragraphs. But the idea is for you to tackle one thing at a time, one part of your story at a time to keep people's interest. And then voice is something that we're gonna talk about a little bit more. Um, active voice is talking like I'm talking now. It's, being, it's present tense. Um, is there a better way? Let's see. Present tense voice, active voice. I'm trying to think of another way to explain it. Um, so it's, it, it's your speaking voice. It's how you would speak. It's not, um, um, so you can tell a story. Um, downtown today, a building fell down. Oh, this is bad. But a building fell down downtown today. Two people were killed, right? Um, or you could write the story in the passive voice, which might be, um, oh, well, no. A building fell down downtown today, killing two people. That's active. If you say a, a building fell down or maybe a building was raised today and two people were killed, it's not as compelling. You can write that way. There are times that you might want to write that way to make something more neutral right, or more passive. Um, but on the web, you want to be active as though it's happening right now and as though you're speaking with somebody. So if you are pulling out your big 50 cent words or if you're trying to figure out how to make the sentence sound to impress, sound more impressive, you're, you've lost it already. Just keep it simple. How you would say it to your friend, how you would say it to your mother, how you would say it to um, somebody at your job. And one way to obviously kind of get your active voice hat on is to read a lot of web articles. But also, they do, they usually use, at least in the US, they use active voice on television too. So when you're interested, a script is very similar. So what we call a, a script for television is very similar to web content in that it's short. Um, so both of them utilize the same sort of format. So that's another way for you to think about how you can prepare yourself to move into another area. Of course, you want to master one area first. But if you get web content well, you could get television content well, because that's, that's exactly how I did it. So active voice. Nice, right? OK, let's talk a little bit about some of the different forms of social media. I know that some of you are already familiar with some of them. Some of, them, some of you are already using them. Um, but I'm going to just go through a list of about 10 that we thought, given the kinds of things that people in this class have shared with us that they do, whether they're writers and or photojournalists and or documentarians, that you might want to tap into um, as things at least to explore. So. I know there's a conversation going on here about blogging. Um, what um, blogging is, is merely an online personal journal where you share your, rep your reflections, your, your, your comments, your hyperlinks, your thoughts. Um, you own the content of the page. You are reporting on whatever aspect of your life or sharing about whatever aspect of your life. Um, I know you guys are familiar already with blogging. I'll add to that. Yeah. Some major sites use blogging. So I used to enter, do an entertainment blog for CNN. I didn't own that content. They own that content. New York Good Times point. has bloggers. Um, a lot of major publications have bloggers. But the style is different. It's more personal. It's more intimate. So you can use these. You can, so it's another way for you to break in, right? It's for you to cultivate your own voice and to create blogs that you want to write about but can easily translate into something that you do for a major publication. Either way, the goal is strong writing. 
So blogging can be something that you just do for yourself and a way for you to elevate your own voice and get people interested in your kind of work, or it could be a way, an entry way into writing for a major publication. Yeah, and so the comment that you made about the importance of strong writing, no matter where you write, is really the reason that I don't blog. I have a lot of things on my mind, but I don't have a lot of time. I write for a living, therefore I don't feel like I can afford to show up with um, raggedy writing on a blog. Um, because I'm a professional writer, I would want my writing on a blog to be at the same level as my professional writing um, that I get paid for, and I just don't have the time to do that, so I choose not to blog. It's not a good fit for me, I don't think. Other writers are definitely able to blog. They love blogging, and maybe they don't have the hang-ups necessarily that I have, um, and it works well for them. So blogging is something that you, should, you can consider. Um, Facebook, so we're, um, we have our UNESCO journalism group on Facebook. So Facebook is the world's largest social network and it allows members to interact with each other and share information. Um, it's been really interesting for me to watch my Facebook following grow. And this is an area where I've decided that I want to concentrate. Um, I was dibbling and dabbling in several different forms of social media, and I actually felt like I wasn't doing very well. But I had a meeting with somebody relatively recently who's a social media expert, and they were like, well, Hillary, for what you want to accomplish in the world, Facebook is actually a good place to do that. And so what I've decided that I want to accomplish in the world is it's occurred to me over the last year as in the United States, we've been having this conversation about Black Lives Matter and what happened at Ferguson, and um, that the people who I am friends with because of where I was educated, because of where I just so happened to grow up and some other things, are actually very influential people throughout American society. And so a thing that I realized I could do is lead in the world through my pa Facebook page, through the content that I post on my Facebook page. So through teaching people about different ideas, through sharing health information, through, I, you know, I wrote this book on black boys, I do a lot of research on black folks in education, um, and I can speak very articulate, articulately about race in a way that is able to cross race, cross gender, um, and be backed by data. A lot of the people who are in my friendship network, particularly my friends from college, they wanna know the statistics. They wanna know where's the source? Where did you get that from? Not just your opinion, Hillary. And so I realized that I can lead in the world. I can influence my friends to help create the kind of world that I wanna live in through my Facebook page. So I've decided I want to spend time, invest time in my Facebook page. Um, so for those of you who are my Facebook friends, if you kind of scroll down my page over the last two weeks I've been here, I've been trying to do some teaching on my Facebook page to my friends, teaching about Ethiopia by writing some first person pieces on Facebook where I talk about examining my own biases, or maybe I didn't really have a bias about it, but I just say I do to open other people's hearts to the thought that maybe, well, if Hillary has a bias, maybe I have a bias too. If she admits she has a bias, maybe I have a bias too. So I've been doing some of that. I've been sharing photos, that kind of thing. Um, and people have been really active on my page. Go ahead. I'll say this as we go through the list of social media places. Uh, be careful about what you post anywhere. Um, you want it to be the best reflection of you as you look for work. Um, the CNN blog that I mentioned that I got, I got it because someone saw some of my work on Facebook. And I think one of the reasons why I get work uh, fairly frequently via Facebook is because I'm not posting things that are incredibly controversial. I am not um, saying anything that could be, be, be perceived as really negative. Um, so you want to make sure that you utilize all of these social media um, opportunities as a way to brand yourself. Branding is a huge word in the United States. Mm -hmm. Branding yourself means to only put your best foot forward at all times. You have to remember that the people who are on your page, and of course you have control over who accesses your page. You can have a fan page, uh, you could have your own personal page, you can monitor who's able to see what. All these things can be very useful in making sure that you can maintain your, your authentic self as well as present yourself well for professional opportunities. But I would just caution you that there are some journalists who have you know, tweeted out, for instance, something that they could not take back because people have done screen grabs and it's costing their jobs, it's costing their livelihoods. So whatever it is that you do on social media, regardless of what um, aspect of social media you're using, I would definitely keep that in mind. Yeah, so part of, what, part of my brand that I wanna convey, I want to convey, um, 
Um, I want to inspire people. I want to be positive. I want to challenge. I want to want to communicate some challenging things. I want to lead. I want to um, have open and on honest conversations. I have a very diverse friend friend group in my life and on Facebook. And so I want to push some conversations forward about race, for instance, on my Facebook page. And so I'm willing to take some risks, but not do anything stupid. I'm willing to take some risks that challenge everybody, um, including myself. So that's part of my brand. Um, I want to also model freedom. So I mentioned before that I have a coaching business that I'm developing. And so um, I like to tell stories of my friends who have found their passion and have changed their lives and now love what they do, just like I've done. So I tell friends stories of those kinds of things. I've been um, posting some really nice things about you guys finding your passion. And the fact that I, at 53 years old, am on the opposite side of the planet, ha planet having this amazing experience when a lot of my friends are just like locked down in their jobs and are feeling miserable. I'm role modeling, but I'm also kind of promoting my brand that when, I'm, when I decide to get serious about my coaching business, which will be soon, um, that I'm walking the talk, I'm role modeling it, and I'm somebody who you can trust and who can lead you to help you free yourself. Um, so those are some of the messages that I'm communicating through my Facebook really intentionally. Um, so you can have a personal page right now. You know, I've struggled with this. So there are fan pages. I have a, I have a fan page, I guess. I don't post to it really regularly because, yeah, because I just decided, you know what? My friends, I have friends from my entire life. And, and the way I define a friend is either I know you or you're the, the good friend of a good friend, or maybe I went to school with you and maybe you weren't in my class, you were in my brother or sister's class who were younger than me, but you're part of my community. Um, I wanna have a conversation with you. Um, I, am, I think at this point in time, I'm kind of less interested in having a conversation with random people. Um, that's just a strategic decision I've made for now. Eventually, I may reconsider that. So I have a Facebook capital P page. It says Hillary Beard, author, editor, something. Um, and I post sometimes there, but mostly I'm posting on my personal page. And only my friends and my friends of friends can see what I'm posting. Yeah. And I have a slightly different approach. I allow most people on my, my um, Facebook page. I just monitor what it is I say. I like to have different eyes and, and for people that I don't necessarily know to contribute to the conversation. A lot of times, uh, Facebook is a really great place to just generate ideas. So you'll, you'll find that some people that maybe you weren't in your network or you didn't really know um, can contribute to you in a good way. And it's also good for relationship building. I can't even tell you how many people I have met who have become part of my network because I really identify with something that they said or they work with, for some place that I had a desire to work for or do some work with. And there end up being collaborative opportunities because uh, you know I, I really wasn't all that strategic. Um, I will take you know, kind of like, you know, people start posting crazy stuff. I will just make sure that I can't see it <laughs> or I will not necessarily um, stay their friend. But I but it is a good way to just have eyes on your work. And sometimes have the more eyes on your work, the more opportunities can come your way. So it's, there's no right or wrong. It's what's good for you. But it's just, you know, keeping in mind branding, it's keeping in mind your intentions um, and it's keeping in mind whatever it is that you post your work. That's the best reflection of you. Um, I'm more careful on Twitter um, around separating myself from maybe the company that I work for because I happen to know a lot of journalists are on Twitter. Um, and so I will, uh, in some cases, when I've worked for some place, I will, I will put like a little uh, um, disclaimer at the bottom of my profile saying, these are my personal views, not the, per not the views of my company. Um, that can be helpful. Now I, now, I tend to not put anything potentially crazy on any of my social media because you don't know who's in your groups so you could take word back someplace else even if they're not part of your um, initial circle but that is a way that I at least attempt to give the um, impression of church and state as we like to call it um, one completely being different from the other. I think intention matters and so in that way I think it's been useful for me to do that. On Facebook I just you know maybe this is maybe not gonna you know help overall but like I just I tend to try and just um, 
if I don't have, if I, if there are eyes on, on my work that, you know, like my bosses, employers, I don't really, so, so some people will befriend their bosses or people that they work with and some people won't. Some people will have separate pages for friends and colleagues and some people will have a separate page for, or sub, for friends and some will have a separate page for colleagues. That's what one, one way to manage it, manage it as well. Some people will have accounts under their actual name and some people will have accounts under their nickname. Um, I think there's ways for you to manage it so you to be able to do what you want to do without having to have everybody in your business and potentially expose yourself to problems. And so one of the points we wanted to make was given whatever you decide your brand is. So for instance, if my brand on Facebook were to be a health journalist, I could just post health content all the time and begin to form a community that wants to talk about health, right? So you can decide what you, um, what you communicate, you can create your own content, but again, the quality of it is really important. Um, so Twitter, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Twitter. Twitter limits the message size. It used to limit it to 140 words, but now there are all these different apps that you can use with Twitter that can allow you to post longer posts, or certainly in Twitter, you can link out to other stories. So you can create a short 140 word, uh, 140 letter post, and um, that's like a catchy headline, and then embed a hypertext link to one of your stories, or maybe to your Facebook page, or um, to a photograph that you've taken that may be on display someplace. And you can, you can post to videos. Those of you who are videographers and documentarians will talk in a moment about how you can create your own channel on YouTube that reflects your brand, and you put up your own videos, and you can put links to, um, to YouTube's and YouTube and other kinds of sites. So these are ways that you can help to build an audience that's international and direct people um, to your work yourself without waiting for somebody to um, bless you and say you're good enough and therefore we, we choose you. You can choose yourself, right? And um, not have to wait for other people. And it takes a while, but you can be smart and strategic, which is another conversation that we'll have. But you can, over time, begin to build a following. And you guys are already a community. And no matter what social medium you decide to use or media you decide to use, you can decide we're going to help each other by sharing each other's content. And that can help you build your followings more quickly. I Piggyback on what Taylor yes. just said. Um, I tend to use maybe two, three forms of social media. Um, that's just my comfort level. I don't have the time to do a whole lot. When, where I can link one to the other, you know, Facebook will link automatically to Twitter depending on, you know, how you configure it and vice versa. Um, I'll do that. So, you know, we're not necessarily saying that you've got to do every single form of social media in order to gain a following. Now, the more time you have, to cultivate your following using as many of these as you feel comfortable with, the better. But um, you don't think that you have to necessarily compromise the quality of what your content is that's going out into the universe by trying to like do everything. Sometimes it's a matter of finding where you're strongest and starting there and seeing where else um, you might want to go, depending upon what kind of um, audience you're trying to, to, uh, to have. Yeah. I quit Twitter recently. I mean, I didn't quit quit, but I was trying to keep up with Twitter. I have these friends and our fellow journalists who are like masters of Twitter. I look at what they do. I can't do what, I don't have time to do what they do. I can't do what they do. I don't know what they're talking about sometimes. <laughs> um, um, so, and then what I find myself doing is just forwarding interesting stories that somebody else wrote or forwarding other people's tweets. I really don't have the mental bandwidth to sit and be creative and strategic with Twitter. I love it, I get it, but I, I kind of gave up. That's not really gonna be my lane. Uh, maybe I'll stay active just a little bit, just to be a little active, but, um, and because so many um, writers and so many black writers, and a lot of this Black Lives Matter conversation that we were talking about a lot last week, and I know Robert has talked to you about, a lot of that takes place on Twitter, so I feel like I need to have some kind of a presence there, but I can't keep up, I can't hang, I'm, I can't. In the United States, they have this thing called Black Twitter, and basically it's 
a community of black people who sound off on all kinds of issues. And it's become so massive that they have mainstream publications that are not black publications study and follow and report on black Twitter. It's kind of like what you call the pulse of African-American community in the United States. So it's really big presence. So we're not, of course, discouraging you from you know, us using any kind of social media, but there's the point is there's power um, in whatever you use. Just make sure that you harness it in a way that's going to work for you and also something that's effective for you. Yeah. yeah. So Tamika and I are friends with a lot of the people who were very involved in Black Twitter. And so Black Twitter is holding public figures accountable. It's holding the news media accountable. It is um, doing its own reportage, reporting, um, and... Um, um, really changing the narrative around how African Americans are pr portrayed in the United States because they are calling people out who portray us negatively or who it's yeah. effective. It's been it's, it's been, been effective very effective for change. Like meaning people like you have presidential candidates <laughs> who have mentioned Black Twitter. Um, that is how important the presence has become because it's been a more of a critical mass of black journalists and just, and honestly, just people who are concerned about the issues. So it's a great example of how you can, you can either form community on some of these uh, sites and push your, your work as well, um, or just create change. Yeah, and you can also use Twitter really easily to connect with people who you wanna meet in the world. It's um, actually um, really, really um, not that difficult to do that. So if you have people whose community you want to be a part of, whose extended community you want to be a, a part of, um, start to follow them on Twitter, start to see what they're tweeting, start to see who they're connected to, whose information they're forwarding, and participate in the conversation on their page. Eventually, some of them may follow you back, um, but you may be able to, to direct message them or inbox them or that kind of thing. So Twitter can be a very powerful tool. Um, I, I, but I gave up, so I can't hang. So YouTube, um, particularly those of you who are um, videographers of different kinds, whether you're aspiring to be a professional documentarian or whether you do it as a hobby or whether you just walk around with your um, iPhone, YouTube can be a really effective um, method of communicating, in, communicating information through videos. And so, um, as a matter of fact, we're being filmed right now for a MOOC, a massive online or open course. Some of the biggest universities in the world are now sharing their content on YouTube. They're, um, you can take classes, you can watch classes on YouTube. Um, a lot of this information is free. So you can Google some of the biggest universities in the world or search, their, search them on YouTube and you can find all sorts of content to support you in learning anything that you want. But you can also create your own channel so you can communicate your own message, whatever that may be. You can use your iPhone. You can use, I know some of you are, are going to be serious documentarians. Um, you could um, take something you know how to do and teach. There are channels on there where people are teaching different things. You can do anything you want on YouTube and eventually build a following. And then you can use Facebook or Twitter or some other kind of tool to direct people to your channel. So. If you aspire to be in broadcast news or, or um, be in television in some kind of way, you, can, you don't have to wait till somebody says, you're good enough to be in television. You can start, create your own channel, start to create your own content, and then begin to showcase yourself, create the same kind of thing. In our writing, we wanna create clips on YouTube. YouTube, you might wanna create a portfolio of different videos that you've done that um, showcase your talent so that the world can see, and then you use social media to distribute. Get your movie funded on YouTube. The more uh, follows, the more clicks, the more people are just absolutely mesmerized by your work and say maybe that's something that we should look at distributing, you know, nationally and internationally. I mean, there's a story. I'm going back to Twitter for a second, but there's just, I mean, it's just really all the same. It's just the eye, the number of eyes on your stuff. There's a story that, uh, that um, was kind of controversial on Twitter this past week in the same way that you, uh, YouTube can be used that uh, this woman tweeted out randomly, the story of her life. Um, and it was so captivating that she is being offered movie deals. Oh. This is just a story that she, it was like a uh, number of tweets that she did, but so many people read it, celebrities, like so many people read it, it was written up in newspapers, online um, sites, and now she's getting offers for her story. Um, and so there's, there's, it's endless. We, we have Justin Bieber because of you too. I mean, obviously that's like on the entertainment side, but you could do something similar on the more journalistic side as well. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, LinkedIn is a business network. So um, in the U.S., people who are in business, like, you have, do you have a LinkedIn profile? I do. Yeah, we all have LinkedIn profiles. It's a way, essentially, of putting your resume on the Internet. And so you can add the different jobs that you get. You can add to them. You can also create your own. Con so, so you then link to other people on LinkedIn. And um, you can also create your own content on LinkedIn and start to spread it out. So if you want to link, say, I'm a health writer. Say, I want to link to other people who are in the health field. And I want to establish myself as a health writer who's authoritative within the health field. I can, on my LinkedIn page, start to create health content and share it. And it's amazing how far LinkedIn content can travel. And it's traveling in a network, oftentimes, of decision makers. So this is another um, social media that, uh, channel that you have. LinkedIn is an alternative to creating your own website because all the information that you, so you can do it for free. Everything that you want to present on your own website, for instance, you can present it for free on LinkedIn. I mean, there's also de different platforms that you can use to create your own free website at this point um, where people will just come to your um, website. But initially when you're building an audience, it's great for you to have a LinkedIn presence because people may just see your name connected with other people who write what you write and just click on you because they, they see that there's a connection there or connection of friends. So it's just, it's just, these are other ways in which it will cost you nothing but time to put together your presence and to utilize just the eyes that could potentially fall on your page um, on, on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Tamika and I have a mutual friend who uses Foursquare. He's been using Foursquare for a long time. I used to be like, why is he using Foursquare? So Foursquare um, is an app that has a GPS um, function embedded in it. And so you check in, you put the app on your phone. As you go places, you check in with Foursquare and other people will be able to see, oh, Hillary checked in at the supermarket. Hillary checked in at the coffee shop. Hillary checked in at the movie theater. Hillary's at this club. Hillary's here. And so um, you can use it. Um, to find out where some people, people who are on Foursquare, who maybe you're interested in, you can find out where they are and where they go so that you can um, perhaps be in their community and develop a relationship with them or um, kind of follow their brand that way. This particular person did it. Over time, he went to the same places and he began to leverage the size of his audience with the fact that I come to your store. Will you advertise on my website? You know, or the fact that I'm here brings people here. I check in with my fans. They know I'm here. They know I'm a writer. They know I'm going to work here all morning. So that my presence attracts them to your store um, or to, to your establishment. Now, I want you to, um, I'm bringing money to you. I want you to support my blog, right? So this is a, a way this person leverages um, Square. There's Instagram, so many of you know this, um, especially the photographers. So Ruddy Roy was here last week, right, teaching photography. And when I, I mean, since I first followed Ruddy, I think in like a week or something like that, he had like several thousand more followers on Instagram. So Instagram is a site where you are uploading visual content, it's photographs, it's videos, and people follow your visual content. If you guys didn't get to meet Ruddy, he would be a great person to follow first. R U D D Y R O Y E. He's a photographer who was part of this group. Um, and so it's for imagers, it's Im image makers, it's for taste makers, and you can develop followers. So um, I don't know if you guys know this. Um, those of you who are in the photojournalism class might know it, but while Ruddy was here, Ruddy posted some of the photographs that he was taking around Addis Ababa to um, Instagram. Somebody saw it. He left here to go to India. He didn't go back to the US. So he was offered an opportunity to go to India based on his photography. So that can be a really powerful um, channel for some of you who are visual people, or you can do the same thing with videos. They'll allow you to sh um, post short videos. Um, yeah, so there are people who make a lot of money. They figure out a way to monetize it. And um, yeah. And through my job, I'm, I'm editing for Ebony Magazine. As Hillary mentioned, it's one of the top publications, African American publications in the US. There is a man named Devin Allen who just so happened to be at the right place at the right time, single dad worked in retail, amateur photographer. He uh, was in Baltimore um, this past summer when there was uprising, a racial uprising, 
and he took some phenomenal pictures. Um, he posted them to Instagram. One of his pictures was chosen for the cover of Time Magazine. He is now receiving awards. This man has basically launched his career on the strength that he had a camera and a dream and was in the right place at the right time and posted to Instagram. So, I mean, it can literally happen like that overnight. Um, he's a great example of that. Yeah. And that reminds me. So I, I imagine for the photojournalist, Whitney might have shared this statistic to you. Um, and it's something like this. So she was saying um, in the... In every place in the world, basically, except Africa, the images coming out of those areas are being created by people who are from those areas, right? So she shared with me something like 90% of the images of Africa that are being used, that are being published around the world are not being generated by Africans. And so for those of you who want to make your name um, as Africans generating images about Africa, this can really be a powerful platform for you as the world starts to look for images about Africa by Africans. Nobody knows Africa, nobody knows Ethiopia, nobody knows Addis up close and personal the way that you guys do. Yeah, especially as foreign uh, news opportunity, foreign bureau news opportunities shrink. So like back in the day, for instance, Associated Press would have bureaus in all parts of the world. Now, money is dried up, and, and also the culture has changed a bit. You can find talented people who can shoot wherever they're at, and they become the, the go-to people for some of these larger publications. Um, so absolutely, like this is an opportunity that has nothing to do with what you've done before. It's the quality of your work now. Pinterest. Um, so Pinterest is a... Uh, it's, I don't use it very much. I had to read a little bit about it. So it's a visual discovery tool to help you find ideas for things. And so you go on the site, you sign up, and you start. Um, so it's a combination of the words pinning something, like you would pin it on a um, bulletin board, right? But now you're pinning images. And Tamika told me today, you can actually pin words as well or written things as well. You create a site for yourself that um, is a montage of images that are interesting to you. So it ends up being like a collage or a mosaic of you. It, it, it ends up reflecting you, your aesthetic. And so you pin them up and then you can link through them, you can click through and find other related images um, on Pinterest. It's a virtual bulletin board. I have books that I've been published in that I pinned on Pinterest. Um, it's a way for you to brand yourself, show all the things that you're interested in, pacemakers see your stuff there, and then you can also attach your work, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if we had had um, internet here, like access to the internet, I was gonna try Periscope and Meerkat. So these are two new apps. You can download them on your phone and they allow you to broadcast live from wherever you are. So I could literally just open the app. Well, I, I could um, um, send out a message to say that at five o'clock, whatever this time zone is, at its out of the time, I'm gonna be doing a lecture on whatever, social media, how you can start your business, leverage social media to start your business. And I could turn on my phone and I could point it at me or set it on some kind of a stand at me and I can start talking. Next thing you know, people from all around the world are watching you. So for those of you who are interested in, in, interested in any broadcast kind of thing, you can use these two tools, Periscope and Meerkat, to broadcast to people all around the world. You, I've had friends who, they just at their at their desk in their home at night after they leave their job they have something else that they're really passionate about and that they envision to be their future and so they just set up their periscope and they say okay i'm going to be on periscope between this hour and this hour and this is what i'm going to be talking about or teaching about or communicating and um, maybe they communicated on twitter or um, on their Facebook page or some other social media. Um, there are ways to connect these with Twitter, so it will just go out on Twitter. You can hashtag it, so it will go into whatever communities. And you just start broadcasting live from where, wherever you are. I have a friend who um, was actually, we were at Mercado today. We actually could have taken a, if we had data, which we didn't, access to the satellite, we could have walked around and just broadcast from Mercado all around the world. This is Mercado. Um, so this is a tool that some of you may find really powerful. You could also monetize it. You could attach it to your website. 
some people that I know, they workshop, they, they, cho- they, um, they charge people to access their knowledge. So, you know, they may have some kind of system set up where, you know, for a certain amount of money per month or for, you know, one episode at a time, people pay this much amount of money to see whatever it is you're broadcasting. These are all different ways to generate income that could completely be self-contained. You don't have to work for, you know, any publication necessarily to get your voice out there and you, you don't have to necessarily rely on any um, one outlet either to make money. So it's just another opportunity for free, essentially, that you can do it. Yeah. And to build on the monetizing idea, you can also, um, for instance, um, Periscope. So I have a friend. She, um, once a week, does some content. She offers some content for free over Periscope. And at the end of the conversation, she says, if you want more, go to my website. Here's the link. You know, click through on this website. And here is my paid content. So here is the webinar, the online webinar that I'll be teaching. And here's how much it costs you can sign up. So a webinar is a class or a seminar taught over the internet using, um, you will often create slides for it, right? And so there are webinars where, um, so you send out a link and you say what time you're gonna be teaching and people click on it and they sign up, they may need to pay to access it. And then you start talking into your computer and it's broadcast out through the app to the people. Um, Typically you've created slides for your presentation or sometimes it's slides and they can see you. Um, And so there's slides and you're teaching like you might at school. You sit there and talk into your computer and they're on the other end and they can listen. They can click various things on the computer and raise their hand to ask you a question. So they raise their hand to ask you a question. On your end, you manipulate the app. So you can't hear your audience until you open the microphone and you open the microphone for this particular person and the person either says to you or they can type, you can chat, they can chat with you. I have a question about this, I didn't understand this. Um, So they can ask that or they can chat it. Or maybe you're offering the webinar um, and they are, um, when you offer the webinar, you can also give them a call-in telephone number that they can call in either from their computer or from their cell phone to listen to you while they're watching the visual content on your screen. So that's a webinar. You can also do podcasting. And so a podcast is just your own radio show. Right. So many of you um, who if any of you have new iPhones, there might be an icon on there for podcasting and you can sit in the privacy of your home with a microphone and um, um, or maybe GarageBand if you have a Mac like, or, or whatever, an, an, an audio app and you just start talking or teaching or you host your own radio show like somebody else is there. Or we could right now record a podcast and I could do a Q&A with Tamika Anderson, this multimedia journalist and communications expert, and we could just have a conversation. We would record it and then we can upload it and um, to the internet. So we can put it on Hillary's channel and today Hillary interviews Tamika Anderson um, and maybe that's my brand. Maybe my brand as a podcaster is to interview famous journalists or famous people in the media. Maybe that's what I do and then I become known for that and people start to listen and watch. You can create, you can communicate all sorts of um, creative content. In the US right now, stories, like people are driving to work and they're listening to podcasts or they're um, at the gym and they're on the treadmill or whatever and they don't wanna hear the music blaring, they're like listening to stories. So those of you who are fiction writers and storytellers, you can um, read your story into a podcast and and communicate it broadly. Stories right now are really huge, um, at least in the US and so, Right now, podcasts are very exciting. Like people, some people aren't listening to the radio anymore. They're only listening to podcasts. They get to choose, I wanna listen to this person. This person um, communicates inspirational messages or this person talks about sports or this person talks about entertainment or this person talks about the media. This person's Um, expert in Ethiopia. Yeah, now one of the most powerful things about all of these tools is that they're free. Right. So you have to put in the whatever sweat equity of the time, the creating your content, 
like Tamika said earlier, you want to communicate whatever you communicate it. You want it to be excellent because anybody in the world can hear you or see you or see your work and choose you. So you want to put your best face forward. You want to put your brand forward, the brand that you want to be known for in the world. But you no longer need um, the powers that be to like you, to think you look the right way, to think you weigh the right weight, to think that you're the right color, to think that, that you got the right education and therefore choose you. you you can choose yourself and um, um, commit yourself to this activity and over time build a massive following and um, begin to monetize it or get the exposure that you need to begin to embark upon the career that you envision for yourself, connect with opportunities where people hire you um, and um, communicate the messages that you want to be in the world to help change the world so the world can be the kind of place that you want to live in. You, we all have that power now. It's a big shift that has taken place. And so we really encourage you to explore them. Um, Black Twitter is taking on the U.S. media in the United States, and African Americans are, despite we've had this conversation over the past two and a half weeks, right, um, um, the position that African Americans often occupy within American society, many of us are poor. 40% of African American children are born into poverty, right? But even as a low income person, you can access this free tool from your phone, from a computer, and begin to um, start to create a way out for yourself. Talent is talent. Um, I met a brother in Panama who wanted to be a writer. And um, he asked me for some suggestions on how to break into media, some, you know, some places he might want to write for. Um, he didn't have, I think, any kind of clips to his name. He was a blogger. Um, and I just finished paying him, well, through the company that I edit for, a whole lot of money to write content for this magazine, for this national publication, simply because he had put his stuff online and I could read it. Um, there are, my colleagues are constantly combing social media for talent. It doesn't matter if you have a degree. Can you tell a story well? Can you captivate people's attention? Do you have followers? Do people click on your website? Um, it is all about how well you do, not about what your background is. Like I said, that this gentleman had, he was working in retail, but he had a good eye and he had a decent camera. And he took the time to take great pictures. I mean, the cover of Time Magazine is, that's one of the top publications in the United States, regardless of race. That's, it's, that's, that's, some people, I'll just put you this way. Some people work for 20 and 30 years and never see that. First time out, home run. So we can't drill that into you enough. Whatever it is you put out, make sure that you want that to stay you know, a representation of you, um, have it be great work. Yeah, and um, get in the game, right? Um, I can be a perfectionist, right? I can, um, and I want my work perfect, but sometimes I battle myself between having the work better, 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 and getting it out in the world. You want your work to be excellent, but you also want to get out in the world, so I want to encourage you to get in the game. Um, in the United States, they have these things called the lottery. Do you know what the lottery is? It's gambling, basically. It's sponsored by the government, right? And it's, um, you buy, you guess, you, you see if you can guess the number that they pick. If you guess the right number, like you pay to buy a ticket. If that's the right number, you win some money. So mostly people pay to pick the wrong number, um, but they pay week after week. And, and But every week, like one person wins or two people win and they win a lot of money. And so the motto, for the lottery in some states is you gotta pay to win, right? And so um, you've gotta play to win. And so that's what I wanna suggest to you. You've gotta play, you know, take some risks, get out of your comfort zone. I know this whole thing is a huge risk. You're playing, like keep playing um, because there's some really unprecedented chances in the history of humankind for you to be able to win, no matter your race, no matter your gender, no matter how much money you came from, no matter whether you went to the right school, no matter whether you know the right people, now is the best time to play. It's, it's so much different than when we started out. I mean, when I started out, you know, it was more traditional channels, you know, you had, like I fought for an internship. Today I wouldn't fight for an internship necessarily, although it would be a good place to start. I would really focus on, you know, building my brand and, and putting it in the right places. That is how I would 
try to break into it um, at this point in the game. You know, there are some bloggers who have gotten probably bigger book advances uh, or some filmmakers who just so happen to have a great storytelling style who, you know, took off above people who have been in the game for much longer. You know, it's a matter of, um, you know, it all goes back to cultivating courage, you know, um, practicing. One of the things that we've been asking you to do is take out a piece of paper and a pen and to free write. Getting yourself into a habit of storytelling and uh, just going through the motions helps to build your courage, your confidence. You can watch yourself become better over time. Um, it gives you the opportunity to look back at where you were uh, then versus where you are now. It gives you an opportunity to just be with yourself on the page. You know, this has nothing to do with social media, but I remember um, one of the first times that I was to write a, a big magazine article. It was a, it was a, it was a cover story. A cover story in a magazine world is the best story you could possibly get in a magazine. It's the one that people see on the magazine newsstand and they buy the magazine because of who's on the cover and they want to flip to what your story is on the inside. And I was so freaked out, so scared. I remember, you know, I just needed I say hand holding because I was nervous about just like kind of what Hillary was saying, you know, um, you just want things to be perfect. You want things to, you know, be so right. And when you're first starting out, it's easy to kind of talk yourself out of doing anything at all because you're nervous about, is this good enough? Um, is this going to be strike the right tone? Is this going to be something that, you know, people are going to receive well? And I'll tell you, um, I have written like so many cover stories at this point, but I remember um, really starting to like talk to myself about, you know, if you want to be a serious writer, you gotta, you've got to write all the time. You can't just show up to the keyboard and, and expect for all this, you know, great stuff to kind of come out if you're going at it cold all the time. You know, one of the best ways is just to keep writing. It doesn't even matter what it is. It's to keep writing. That's how you build your confidence. So that when you do have that opportunity to shine, you know, you're ready. Yeah. A lot of writers have a daily writing practice, whether they write full time or not. Some do, like as soon as they wake up, before children, before people start pulling on you, boom. Roll over in your bed, open your journal, boom. Some people don't stop writing until they've written three pages. It could be anything. It could be their dream. It could be what they're worrying about. It could be their... Um, goals and objectives, their to-do list for the day, just get in the habit of writing. It builds so many different muscles in you. Or in, in storytelling in general. Take your camera everywhere you go. Yeah. Take pictures, you know. Spend some time of the weekend editing those pictures. Playing with it. See yourself get better. You know, compete with yourself. How good can I be? Keep working at it so that, like I said, any opportunity that presents itself, you can knock it out the park the first time around. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Backpack journalists are what we call self-contained units. They can do everything. Um, they can, and so they, they're storytellers with the ability to tell stories in different mediums. They are people who have mastered the ability to, or work at mastering, the ability to write, to shoot, to edit what they've shot, to pr produce it, um, and put it all together. So, you know, as we meant, as Hillary mentioned yesterday, um, Anderson Cooper is someone who is like, or, or foreign correspondents, for instance, are examples of backpack journalists. You know, the people who you could say, listen, there's a war in, you know, whatever country. We don't have the money for a producer and a camera guy and an editor and, you know, so you're it. And they send you with the tools or you already have the tools. And you go and you put the story together in the way that can be uh, distributed over the television or the Internet. So it doesn't necessarily have to just be, you know, a foreign war correspondent who's shooting for television for CNN, for instance. It could be someone who's going to shoot similar content for the web, someone who can write a story about what's happened and put their pictures together in like a, like a picture book that people can flip through. Or the main focus of the web content might be the pictures with captions at the end. But the point is you have the ability to tell stories in a variety of ways. And it means that you have um, developed the, the technical skills to do that. Yeah, and we were talking about, is it bag pack or backpack? 
I think that maybe we use different words here. Maybe you guys call that thing on your shoulders a bag pack. We call it a backpack. So, when, but we we googled bag pack and it said, "Do you mean backpack journalism?" So um, maybe that answers that piece. And so the so I mentioned to you that that a favorite a favorite journalist of mine is Anderson Cooper, who's on CNN. He's primarily doing domestic stories in the United States. But so Anderson Cooper is from one of the um, most wealthy families in the world. He had a tough growing up though. His parents weren't together. He was raised by his mom and he had a brother who committed suicide. He suicide. He jumped out of the window of their high rise apartment. So he was heartbroken, right? He went to, he went to school, he went to college, but he wanted to make a name for himself. Guess where he came to make a name for himself? Africa. So he didn't take advantage of any of his family's connections. He went to the place where Americans didn't want to go to report stories. He came to this continent and went to the most challenging places and found the best stories that were not reported. He was a backpack journalist, right? He was writing, he was filming, he was doing all of this and developed relationships with a number of different um, television state, television channels and stations and, and, and news organizations and worked his way up the chain of command and now he's at the top of the food chain in the United States. But he's still telling those kinds of stories in the U.S. and around the world. And for him, this was one way that he was able to help heal his broken heart. Um, because he's been heartbroken, he's not afraid to be around people who are heartbroken. Um, and so he brings his full self to where he is. Russell this morning in the photojournalism class was talking about Karen, um, covering Hurricane Katrina and living with the people who had been displaced from their homes in shelters and um, kind of like, they're not refugee camps, but they're shelters where people were displaced to. So um, he came to this continent to report out and worked his way up the world. So again, opportunity, opportunity, you're undercovered. It's, it's, there's opportunity all day. And just with an iPhone. I mean, really, so much, of course, the better, the you know, more up to date the iPhone, the better. But the point is, you can, I'm being paid to write a story and show content, pictures by several websites just based on what I shot in the street today. Um, because it's the example of backpack journalism. You know, they want a piece that they can put on the web where it's written with pictures. That's it. I'm using my iPhone. That's it. A lot of you guys have iPhones, so there's no, there's no reason why you can't do the same thing.